Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Dominant, episode 4 of our look at 92-93, the impossible dream, the greatest season perhaps in our club's history. Joining me to look over, look back, reminisce uh, about the denouement of this special season, Andy McGowan. How are we, Andy? I'm good, man. Looking forward to it. To a degree. <laughs> There's always that that degree. And John Cowden from Athens, of course. Good evening, John. Good evening. Similar to Andy. Um, a bit of a regrets. I've had a few hmm. possibly coming up. <laughs> but what? Well, it's better to be in it than not. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? As we we're very much living at the moment. Um, we're picking this up just after the defeat. The f- you know, finally, a defeat after 44 games at Parkhead. Uh, Rangers have potentially 15 games left in the season. A marathon season. But in all honesty, even at a stretch, you're talking about maybe only five that really need full attention, full concentration that really matter. Three of those um, took place within eight days. Um The league situation, Rangers are very comfortable at the top. They just need to keep walking forward and they will cross the finish line at some point. But to make absolutely sure they weren't drawn into any kind of conversation, Aberdeen came to Ibrox on Tuesday the 30th of March and a defeat of Aberdeen would really, really do that job. And a defeat is what Aberdeen got. And a 2-0 win, Ian Ferguson scoring the first, McCoy's with the second um, to be pelted by golf ball from the Aberdeen support. The Ian Ferguson goal, um, we, we've kind of briefly touched on this, but let's get into it a little bit. Um, and his performance, Rene, so he's been here since, what, February 1988, um, but ha- has had his issues with, with illness and form. This is really him coming into his own um, as a Rangers player, no? Hey, boys. And it kind of changes a Rangers player, certainly to, mm. to my mind, he uh, had adapted his game because he, he wasn't quite the same after the, the bad bout of illness he had, that kind of mystery virus he had. And um, he went from a sposh buckling, almost striker, to much more of a thoughtful and uh, deeper player. And, and, and I, I mean, he did that throughout his career from then on in. I mean, he was still there mm. when Advocate came about as yeah. that kind of player. But he was a more rounded player by now. And um, he really, really contributed this season. And, you know, the fact that he's one of the guys that's getting any medals is, is um, quite fitting because, apart from it being a fantastic achievement, he was integral to a number of those, uh, none more so than this one. So I, it was, I, I, I often think of this as Durant's renaissance, but mm-hmm. it was also in Ferguson's. Oh, well, that, that's, that's the point that sometimes missed. John, where does Ferguson sit? I mean, he, he has... 10 league championship medals the, the extra one with Advocate he has the 9 in a row of course uh, but as I said he, he's in and out for, for, for a few of those years preceding this year and 93-94 maybe one of the only ones that can salvage any kind of uh, reputation from that season which we'll come to in, in the due course but, but, but I really think he, he's one of a few obviously in a special season you need a few players to step up to the mark and he's one that maybe just gets forgotten about because of the heroics at either end of the field Yeah I would agree with, with Andy as well he, he's changed for, uh, from that swashbuckler he wasn't actually I think the reason why he's underrated is for the first three four years three or four years. There is a certain element of the support think he's a waste of money uh, because of injuries, because I think because he's Scottish, uh, being brutally honest, mm-hmm. when he joins in 88, we are still on our, you know, England international bench. And, and as soon as he's made it clear, yeah, as soon as he's made it clear, he's not <laughs> going to be held ransom to any Scottish club, not paying over the odds and, he eventually does. Um, I think Rangers got their money's worth overall. But yeah, I think that's probably a fair point at that time, John. Yeah, no, it was. But and I don't, Rangers is a difficult club to come into. And I think if you're a, a Rangers supporter coming into play, I think the pressure you put on yourself is, is enormous. I remember reading Alec McDonald's book or whatever. I think you, it, it does take a while. We expect players to hit the ground running, even until this day. And it rarely happens, and usually the ones that do hit the ground running hit a wall about December. It's uh, 
Mm. You know, it, it's the guys that take a while to feel their way in, and everybody writes them off, and then suddenly he's a bit of a player. It, we are really quick to make judgments both ways with players. But he is coming into it. I mean, he is. It's probably since 92, really, that he's mm. beginning to... He's still got a few injury issues, but yeah, I don't know where he sacrifices himself. I don't know where he thinks of him. He changes it, his conscious, but he is, when we sign him, he is an attacking midfield player uh, who will score goals, brilliant shot, to dropping back quite a bit. And it's almost similar to Giant in some ways, um, for different reasons. And he's just... He, is, is it because he doesn't do the spectacular things? And I, I don't mean he's a grinder or, or whatever, but he doesn't really... He, he isn't a standout. He's just one of those solid guys. And I don't mean 7 out of 8 out of 10. I think he's much higher than that. But he's just underrated. I think some of it is because people thought they were, were a lot wrote him off very early on because of all the things. And yeah, we can more than get the money's worth for him. He was, you know, just one of those players that that team wouldn't have been that team without it. You know, him, Durant, McCoy, Brown. You know, the Blue Noses and the team actually did make the team play 10, 20 percent above the level that perhaps they should have done. Uh, you know, and that's what makes a difference. I think in many ways in in big seasons, you know, that you just get players who will, you know, get it. We'll we'll get to the point. You know, you see it in the end of season videos or whatever. The songs are all started by Fergie and Brown. Yeah, <laughs> the feet stamping and everything. And we buy into that. We don't buy into the players necessarily. I don't think and identify it. But when you look back and you remember this team we love. It is because they sing the songs. It's because you feel as if they are one of us. An extension of, of the are, support. Some of them. Yeah. 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 And no, I, that. I, I said last week that, that when we come back to the end, but the, the, there's many reasons why this particular team, this particular season, is so loved. But for sure, the uh, the closeness, the proximity um, that the fans felt. With this group, um, football was going to change. Was going to change an awful lot after 1992, and that proximity just gets gets blown away. Um, good point though, John, about Rangers legends. I guess uh, that that take a while to 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 really you know come to fruition. Those that start like a firework do kind of fizzle out. In my time, I guess the obvious exception has been Gascoigne Lodrop. But uh, yes, the three standouts this season: Gorham, Hately, McCoyst. They all had their difficulties early on. Um, Rangers went down to Turnbury. Uh, for a, a bit of a uh, retreat before the Scottish Cup semi-final and it's only now that the Walter Smith is talking uh, quite openly, quite honestly about the treble um, he kind of dismissed talk of it but he can't avoid it any longer um, he says after such a long run of games it would be nice to finish with the treble to everybody here it would mean a great deal all big clubs have historical backgrounds and people remember treble winners from different eras if the 92-93 team could be remembered that way, it would be a big thing for all of us. Well, Hart stood in the way of the final, the semi-final being played at Parkhead on the 3rd of April, and with 20 minutes remaining, it looked like that treble dream was fragile. They had a lead, Alan Preston had given them that, it was deserved, he'd found some space in between Goff and McPherson to head home a John Robertson cross, and it felt a wee bit... With a big game in the horizon that we'll come to, the Rangers were maybe just trying to do enough but no more, uh, and you know were punished. They looked listless, um, but similar to the Leeds game, Rangers just changed the script with a bit of luck, sheer determination. Um, now the equaliser comes from a corner that absolutely was not. Um, McCoy's shot didn't deflect off anybody, um, but if Hearts had defended as ferociously as they complained about it, um, they probably um, would have hung on for a little bit longer. Dave McPherson had two attempts in the box to um, find the equaliser, and then McCoy, who else um, would find the winner, bravely running on to Nicky Walker, lobbing him before he was clattered and taken out, uh, and, and Rangers um, back to Parkhead for the, the, the final. Um that was McCoy's 49th goal of the season, his 88th for Rangers in 15 months. 
Uh, and his next goal will be back at Parkhead in a cup final. An overhead kick winner, no less, but we'll get to that. Um, John, Andy, any nerves at all? We're used to this team, Andy, just finding a way to come back, but it, it was flat for an hour or so. I suppose in a, game, in a season of so many games and so many big games, this is what would normally be a big game, but it wasn't by comparison to some of the games we were playing, perversely, so... No, no I think we we suffered uh, as a team sometimes as a support of taking these things for granted, and that's why you know, it's flat, listless, and it certainly was because you can only raise your game so many times. You know, the, 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 too much adrenaline becomes deficits of it, and it, it costs you. So we pulled out in the end, but this is what we'd come to expect for the team. I think there was a mutual understanding between the team and the support that you know it might not always be stellar, it might not always be full, but do everything we can to win. Just winning means everything. So the two goals, I, I mean, I remember this game. There were two. The first one was scrappy. Dave McPherson chips in, and then the second one, typical McCoy's disease. See, I'd actually forgotten it was Nicky Walker. I'd have, I'd have put money on it being Henry Smith, but that's. My Smith was uh, coming away at that point, I think. John, let me guess, uh, if Parkhead had seats, um, you'd have been sitting your feet up with a cigar out, never worried you. It was hearts. I mean, it was one of those things where, I mean, we are in an era which changes from the following season, where, I mean, apart from what Hibs, Aberdeen and Celtic, you know, has anybody beat us in a semi-final or a final for... 20, 20, 30 years, and the hearts are bottle merchants. It, it's one of those where, and actually, the worst thing they could have done was scoring with so much time left. Was it half an hour or so mm-hmm. left in the clock? I mean, it was a great, great goal. Uh, I thought their goal was actually the best in terms of, you know, just because he runs on and puts in. What strikes me is just how empty that Rangers end is, the hearts oh, end definitely. is. Oh, definitely. I was astonished because I would have said that was a sellout crowd and I'm looking at it and one half it is. I mean, they could have played the 11 side game on it. I was, I was stunned. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing that came up and it, it was, and I, I didn't say, I rated Mike first and I thought he was a good servant for us. I think he's been a bit harsh. I think it stands out is in the pre you do wonder why we bought McPherson back at that point and we just didn't go for the future generation and buy McLaren yeah. instead of McPherson that previous summer because you're looking at it and you're going, there's much difference between them. And you get to McCoy's goal, and, I mean, that is bravery because he knows he's getting done. It's not he hits it and then the keeper hits him. He is looking at the bull charging down towards it and he knows when he hits it, he's getting put into the middle of next week. Uh, and he does it. You're always nervous when it goes to 1-0, but you do have this comfort this team. You do think it's hard. And this is, people will laugh. This is Parkhead. At this point under Smith, I mean, is there a ground in the, the country that we're more comfortable at in big games? Mm-hmm. I mean, even when we lose... Should never have lost. Hately misses a sitter. You know, we get scores what six minutes to go, and then he misses what I would have said is a goal that he would have put away the rest of the season. Well, two three minutes to go, we could easily have walked away from Parkhead, having come back for two down with six minutes to play two each. It should have done. Uh, so I mean, Parkhead is a very comfortable place for us to go, and continues to be actually until you know they renovate it. I mean, this first bit under Smith, we look at the number of big games we play at Parkhead and have great results. I mean, it is a shithole, but it's a wonderful place to go at this point as a range support. It was indeed. Where were we going next, of course, was where all the attention was at that moment in time. That trip to Provence. We're giving away there, so say now, to Rudy Voller. Boxic waiting in the middle. A goal for Marseille. Frank Sose. As they look for this equalising goal, Stevens' corner floated in. 
It's a terrific goal by Durant. 1-1. A terrific goal for Rangers. 52 minutes gone. Ian Durant has made it 1-1. Okay, John, I know you were there. You were one of the thousand for the biggest game in, what, 21 years? The club's 160th European tie. Um, really disappointing allocation. Marseille deliberately intransigent, trying to make this cauldron uh, in the velodrome of noise and colour. Van Halen's jump is used as that kind of final rallying cry. Um, you weren't as impressed. Stunned to hear. No. I was impressed with the city. It was a football mad city. And on the way to the game in the bus, I always remember I watched this woman, probably 50s or 60s, in a shop window, um, closed shop window, and sort of waving her fist, not in an aggressive way, but I mean, it was a football mad. But when it got there, it had been built up to be this, you know, will to hell, real aggression. I mean, going to park here. I told you, I think there just did something in this working class sort of Scottish environment and also with a roof on, because it didn't have a roof, so a lot of the noise went up and it was almost too over manufactured. It mm. wasn't something, sometimes you go over the top, I would say, in terms of the music, just me personally. So it probably wasn't as bad as what I remember it, but it wasn't as good as what I expected. It's probably the best way to put it. And there was no hassle outside. Fans to a degree were mingling where I was. Uh, you know, um, it wasn't, it didn't have that tension or whatever that you would get walking up Union Street, going to Pitodri or, you know, the various flashpoints um, coming back from Parkhead. So, no, it wasn't. It was. It was. I just remember it was a, this is where I want to be. I don't mean in terms of physical. This is where I dream of Rangers being the sharp end of Europe. It's not we. It's not so much will. It's just the prospect that we can, and you want to savour it. And it's been a glorious winter, you know, because you've been able to you've been able to enjoy enjoy the ride, you know, look forward, plan things. Teams just kept you in it. This is where you want to be, and you think, <laughs> famous last words, you think, we've made it. And there is a thing of, can we do it? We want to do it this time. But even if we don't, we've made it. There'll be another one. And we'll be knocking on this door for a few seasons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it just is. It is where you want to be. And the velodrome is it's fascinating. It's, uh, there's two batches of range supporters, one official, one unofficial. I was just behind the goal one, but there's another one in the stand where somebody bought a plane pool or whatever. It's just, it is one of those, it's where you want Rangers to be. It's like last season, as we are discussing summer 2022, you know, where you're going away in Europe, you're not, you don't fear embarrassment. You feel you can walk as an equal with these teams. We're maybe not as technically sound, but we're playing with you know, that high tempo and passion when we have to be. And we have some seriously world-class players, I would argue, uh, in, in terms of Durant. You watch that season, Ian Durant, it's phenomenal. I mean, it might be a cameo, but you're looking at this guy and thinking, I watched the highlights, what a player. I mean, a guy that's had knee rebuilt, had to rebuild his career, had to... Build the style of play, and he's producing performances like this. I mean, stunning. You know, just as well for us that he get injured because he, we actually so I, I wouldn't wish it on him, and I wish it hadn't happened for the guy. We get more out of him because of that injury because he would have been in Serie A nineteen ninety onwards. He had that vision. He would have been. He just had it. No, I certainly did. Um... <laughs> Andy, the, the first half, the game starts exactly how the game in Belgium starts, exactly how the game in Bochum starts. Rangers are nervous. It's, it's very scrappy. The Marseille goal. Um, you know, David Robertson got the blame in my house and many others, I imagine. Um, 
uh, I wish he just lost control of the ball and had gone out for a throw in really um, and he he takes responsibility he's that, he's that kind of guy David but you know, there's, there's a lot of corporate responsibility going on here, a lot of corporate blame. Um, everybody could do well, including Gorham, perhaps, but, you know, only a few minutes in, they're ahead, the place is going bananas. But, you know, Rangers, not for the first time, compose themselves. Um, they seem to forget that Haley isn't playing because they're still going direct to, you know, McCoy and Durant, I think. Um, but, there is, an, there is an opportunity for Ali, um, Hooster and Durant combining, that's a big moment. If that's against Motherwell, you, you can't help but feel that the, the net would have rippled there. But, you know, 1-0 at half-time is not dreadful, and, and Rangers have, you know, they, they, they got that composure in. Aye, and, and looking back at it, I mean, I remember at the time, actually, I... I, I over there, and I was in the house watching it on TV, and, my, and Walter Smith's on the TV getting interviewed before it, and that kind of the setting sun in the background, or the, or the lights setting, and uh, he seems really, really relaxed. But as we start the game, we're sluggish, where you can see Marcy have got the impetus, and it's kind of epitomised by that half ass clearance for Robertson, which it, it couldn't have been a worse clearance. <laughs> And uh, you don't really get to survive too many chances when you've got guys like Voller and Boxic and who was it? Sozzi had scored, wasn't it? Yeah, was Sozzi. Yeah. No, Sozzi. Sozzi scored, but who was deadly for for long range or any range actually. So, um, but it goes back to what I was saying about the same feeling with Hearts. You always knew that you were in with a chance as long as any game or tie was alive with this team because they just didn't know how to give up. They they, they, they never knew. Defeat and they manfully kept going because, as you say, it's McCoy. And if you memory, Durant's playing off him as a kind of quasi striker, which kind of ahead of its time at, the, at that point. But, but um, I mean that chance you spoke about. I I, I think we kind of played the occasion as, a, as opposed to just playing the match that night. I think it got to us a wee bit certainly in the first half, and by the second half they were a wee bit more. Relaxed within themselves. Exactly um, the same in Belgium, but just obviously with yeah. a better team. Um, I'm glad Rangers have given up playing the occasion rather than the match yeah, when it comes to <laughs> the big European nights. Um, I mean, Durant's, Durant's goal is, is sublime, made even more sublime, I guess, for us viewers at home um, by the, the, the French director's fondness for this camera angle right on the, the 18 yard line. It would become de rigueur, pardon the pun, um, at France 98 a few years later, um, but you could just see the, the, the swerve. Now, Durant had to take painkillers, they had to take an injection to play, I uh, think like one of the uh, the screws, um, uh, the staples, sorry, um, from his operation had kind of come come loose, it's causing him quite a bit of av- uh, aggravation, you, you, you've had to beg Smith, basically, to, to, to play in the game, such a consistent part of this season um, walking wounded breaking players but didn't want to let the team down, wanted to play in these these huge, huge games um, what we did get in the second half was the Marcy onslaught that we, we probably didn't really get for sustained periods in the first um, that Gorham's bar was getting rattled um, by Soze there was a heart in the mouth moment with um, Abedi Pelly at one point uh, but I'll give them their, their due, um, where Ellen Road had really been about Gorham. Goff and Brown were excellent that night. Real, that was a defensive performance, far better defensive performance than uh, the, the the Leeds um, game. The efforts were mainly from range. Uh, and, you know, Rangers had a decent penalty shout uh, in the first half, um, where, where Bowley, uh, I think, fouls Goff in the, in, in the box, to be honest. Um we will come back to the Marcy stuff um, in a minute, but half time at that match is crazy. Um, Tappy, who's already transfer listed Abadi Pelly, by the way, before this game, that's the kind of cool control that he's displaying at this moment. Um, he walks into the office of the Dutch referee Mario van der Ende uh, and asks him if he could do anything for him and his colleagues. I don't think you you have to be um, 
in with the bricks there to understand what that meant. Um, Van der Ende, who spoke to uh, James Dixon in his excellent book, The Fix, uh, briefly mentioned that last week, and there's an interview with James on, on the network um, a wee while ago. Um, Van der Ende says, look, you know, fortunately I could speak French, uh, and I told him this, very inappropriate for a club president, and, and ordered him out. At the point he ordered them out, you get Gary McSwiggan, who was a sub, uh, and some other Rangers officials coming back up the tunnel. They see this, they see this commotion. Um, I think there's some words exchanged. But nothing is done. This isn't a hidden envelope in a garden somewhere. This is a club president going into the referee's office at halftime in a game they're winning uh, to suggest, is there anything that, that could possibly be done? Um, again, we will... Go back to this uh, further down the line, but it just shows you what incredibly wild, um, nervous, tense night that was. But 1-1 one, one seemed to suit both, although Soze had to say, you know, uh, you know, we were um, pretty shaken by it, didn't expect it. Um, the bookies made range of the favourites because we were playing Cisco at home, they had to go to Bruges. Um but Tappy again at half time was in, in the dressing room, in the Marseille dressing room, telling the players that they weren't fit to wear the Chelsea. And Goethals, I think, actually said, Look, do you want to run this team? I'll just go home. Um, that's the kind of mayhem that the Rangers were up against. Um, but anyway, we were coming to, to, to that, that that famous night then, 21st of April. John, uh, quite a... Quite a memorable night. The build-up seemed to take ages. I do remember the report in Scotland were coming out of maybe Argyle House or one of the hospitality suites before it, um, uh, reporting live. Uh, I think the Billy Boys was getting belted out and the, the tables were getting thumped and everyone was smiling and joking. Um, I don't think that might happen these days. Um, but we're in this situation. It's a head-to-head -head scenario. So um, we need to better Marseille's result. Goal difference doesn't come into it. Even if it did, it's a long shot. Um, and, you know, Bruges had been tough. Tough place to go. Uh, we'd found it tough. We're praying, really, for no news or good news from um, uh, Brussels. Uh, or Bruges, sorry. And we, we don't get it. Uh, very early on, Marseille score a bit of a comical goal. I remember distinctly, given that Rangers had, think Goff had missed a chance, in the first minute, first couple of minutes with a header. And that buzz, that excitement just flattening as noise and news came from Belgium. Yeah. I, I didn't fancy this. Um, I'm just not comfortable relying on somebody else. I thought in Marseille with 20 minutes to go, I think they were to more rattled than at any point it over the two games against us. It wasn't like Ibrooks we brought it back to each. Suddenly they up to gear. I think both teams in Marseille went for a point. I, I genuinely think we should have went for it there because I just couldn't see why Bruges or indeed Moscow would put up so much a fight against either of us. So I just assumed that Marseille were going to beat Bruges and Nothing really changed that. I wasn't down going to the game. I remember going up the steps and one of the pals that sat beside said, 33 years. Uh, you know, I 33 years since we played Eintracht Frankfurt in the European Cup semi-final. Uh, when that one was over. Hmm. And it just, the goal came through. I, I, I didn't think it dropped that much. I, I do think that the crowd stayed with it and there was hope as long as it was one goal. You know, in one mad minute, it could change, but the longer it went on, it didn't. It just didn't feel like one on nights, did it? That, you know, the chances we were missing or whatever. It just, it didn't have a feel of magic uh, to me. But then I was thinking, I was hoping, praying. Don't get me wrong, but I just couldn't. I couldn't see Marseille not winning in Belgium. Um, there is a reason the Belgians speak about 14 languages and three of them are their mm. own ones. Uh, <laughs> they aren't exactly the most um, reputable um, in, in many of their transactions either. So I, I really couldn't see it. But I wasn't responding, as I said, because I was thinking, this is where we want to be. 
we've done this. People say we've ridden more luck, but let's face it, how many times in those six games did we have Hayley and McCoy as a front two partnership? We weren't injuries, etc. So it wasn't all luck one way. There were one or two things. So it was a, you were enjoying the ride. You want to get there, but you didn't expect this to be the end of the journey, whichever happened, whether it was going on to play in Milan or whether it was going on to subsequent seasons. Uh, um, it was just my thing. I mean, I was the impressionable, still then impressionable young 12-year-old who had been in Bruges, had been told by adults, therefore they knew what they were talking about, Andy, that Marseille struggle here. So I assumed that they would. I went to Ibrox, unlike John, um, assuming that these guys knew what they're talking about. They'd draw, and we would obviously beat Siska at home. Uh, and we were going to meet, I was going to Munich, it was agreed. Um, my mother had signed it off, uh, we, we were on our way. <laughs> um, can you remember your, your feelings before the game and after it as you saw? I mean, McCoy misses three huge chances, Brown and Stephen can't get any closer. It's as if there's a force field around that goal. I, I, I truly thought back then that we'd be blown out after Marseille and I'd it's like John saying, I, I could not see Marseille not doing it. And I I didn't have the belief that we were going to go through. I thought we were going to beat Siska and they bother. That, that was a given. There was no way we were going to get this far and then falter at the last hurdle in terms of doing what we had to do ourselves. But I couldn't see Marseille doing anything that wouldn't see them in the final. And it may just be the pessimism in me. It may be the fact that we were in such exalted territory that it was quite unbelievable to think that you were, you know, literally minutes away from the, the, the Pink Cup final, as we probably still thought of it then, the Champions League. Even more unbelievable now when we think about it. So, um, I, I, I was not I was not, I was not counting on Munich. You were going Munich yourself, Martin. Well, this is when it all turned, by the way. I, I was in floods of tears that night and I never believed anything anyone ever told me ever again when it came to Rangers. Um, the, the, the pessimist and the cynic was, was, was born that night. Interesting that you both talk about Marseille as being something that we we blew. Um, now, we record this in, what, August 22. Um, we've just come off a season where we've dropped points at home to Hearts and Motherwell and Aberdeen. Um that's where Rangers blew a title. Those are games we should win. I'm not sure Marseille away is, is, a, is a game where we would expect um, to, to win. Um, a faint hope, given you know just how incredible this team were and, and the story and the journey that was developing. Sure, we, we, we had some kind of hope, as John mentioned. We're walking um, tall with these teams. But you know a draw in Marseille is a fine result. I still maintain when we were at our best and free-flowing with our as strong as a team as we, we could possibly put out with Gorham and, and Haley and McCoy on the pitch was the second half in Belgium um, where Marseille did slip up and we could have gained that advantage and that's when we blew again huge chances when we were on top for a sustained period of a game against a weaker opponent um, I I don't think I could describe that night in the velodrome as, as blowing it. Um, we could have been blown away um, quite feasibly early on because they were an outstanding team. As they went on to show in the final, um, uh, they would win 1-0. Uh, Basil Bowley scoring the goal and ending deliberately, I think, the game and pretty much the career of Europe's greatest striker at the time, Marco Van Basten. Um and it was heartbreaking. And I, did you watch? Did anyone watch the final? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I watched it. I watched it. No, no, I don't recall watching it, but I don't think I did. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really a football fan at heart. Um, it's Rangers or <laughs> bust. <laughs> yeah, I, I did watch it with, with, with pals, um, and that that kind of, uh, oh, it, it was heartbreaking to to to, to watch. And they celebrated, of course, as you would. Um, but there were developments in Paris that would soil this team, soil this season forever. Now, Marseille were going for their fifth title in succession, as well as Rangers, and their first European trophy. The whole of France is waiting for a European trophy. And this, close to the season, was causing Tappy some stress. Um, they were ahead of PSG, but only slightly, and they would play PSG 
the week following the final. And then we go to Valenciennes um, the weekend before, a side who were fighting relegation. So Tapi did not want Marseille involved in some kind of massive dogfight against a team scrapping away the, the Sunday before a, a, a European Cup final um, and then having to go to, to, to play Paris Saint-Germain um, following that. So he sorted it out. Valencia honoured a couple of ex non players, uh, Christophe Robert and the man who scored the winning goal the 86 World Cup final, Georges Bruchaga, and Marseille had won, Jean-Jacques Edley, who had done a sterling job on Lentini in that final. He was asked to sound out his former teammates if they'd be open to going easy on Marseille so they could rest some players, enjoy a quieter game, and 250,000 francs were on offer. Um... Even though they would likely send their side down, Robert and Burishaga agreed, although the latter claimed he'd changed his mind and tried just as he normally would, of course. Um, Adley also approached the player with whom he'd played at Tour, um, Jacques Glassman. He was not so amenable and eventually blew the whistle, starting a chain reaction that would leave Marseille stripped of the title, relegated and consigned to disgrace, while Tappy eventually was sent to prison. Um, that was the story all summer. We might talk about that next week, but what of this Champions League title then, gents? Um, if I can correct one error, one common mistake that I hear, and it cracks me up, Marseille were never stripped of the Champions League title. Still there. They were never stripped. They couldn't defend it. That was more a French intervention. They couldn't have them. Um, they felt they disgraced French football. Um, and Paris Saint-Germain wouldn't take their place, so Monaco did eventually. But they were never stripped of it. Um and clearly, the behaviours of Tapi, the behaviours of Marseille domestically, um, raised a lot of suspicion that this particular title as well was tainted and Rangers were um, obviously disadvantaged. There are four main points, I suppose, four main um, events that Rangers fans talked about then and have talked about ever since. That Siska were bright to go easy on the kind of return fixture in the middle of that group um, stage, Marseille had drawn 1-1, uh, surprisingly, in Moscow, and two weeks later won 6-0. Um, now, the Siska manager, um, Genady Kosliev, uh, suggested they did. In fact, said they did, before recanting, as many did once Tappy had leaned on them. Um, Incredibly, uh, Davy Proven of Radio Clyde fame uh, also suggested that at the time that a few rubles had maybe changed hands um, with with that result. So that was the the first one. We have the Hately referee situation with Bruges, um, and we have the the Siska players being incentivized to try hard against Rangers in that 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 final final game, and the referee in the Bruges Marseille game, or the, the referee and the Bruges team in the, the Bruges-Marseille game. Those are the four. Um, I'll open it out in a minute. My thoughts, I, I would nothing would surprise me with Bernard Tapie. I think that's probably fair to say. It wouldn't surprise me if all those things were true. Um, I'm just not convinced about the actual impact of it. Why would you bribe a team, the weakest team in the group at home, Marseille would win that. The goals don't matter. The 6-0 is a red herring. Unless Rangers come to this Stad Vela Roman draw 2-2, two -two, it doesn't matter, or 3-3 or 4-4 or whatever, none of this is, is, is really going to count. So I think the 6-0 was eye-catching, but Marseille are easily able to, to, to blow Siska away like that. Um, the referee in the Bruges game at home, Ibrox, may well have been nobbled, um, but Mark Cately breaks the rules. <laughs> he gives them a, a, a decision to make and that's on him, really. Um, the incentivization of Siska, yeah, players trying hard is kind of the nature of the sport. I don't think that's that's really an issue. Plus, it's not as if the goalkeeper of the huge game, all these Rangers chances apart from Goffs, missed the target. Um, that was really on us. Um, I do think that there was maybe some tomfoolery in the, the Bruges game that goal that Marseille scored is, is hilarious uh, Bruges and you know James Dixon makes the point you know Bruges still keep attacking um, right to the end but how good they are and how kind of committed they are in the final third I'm not entirely convinced um, but again Andy we don't hold our side of the bargain and this is the point um, our contributory negligence in this whole affair um, is, is, is maybe the, the issue in terms of it, the efficacy of it my point is that Tappy going into that referee's room alone 
in that half time of our game should have been enough um, but Rangers would not push it and the same way that Marseille didn't push it when Benfica had a bit of an issue with them that, that, that robbed them of a place in the 1990 European Cup final these clubs want to play the game they want to be part of this elite they want to be part of this group if they're going to be a whistleblower you aren't going to be part of it um, but my issue was really with, with Rangers staying quiet about about that not that all this had, had any kind of big effect on, on the outcome your thoughts on the Marseille charade and then John uh, I, I think you need to look at Tappy I mean we're talking there as if you know you can say right well a rational person wouldn't do this because of that and X, Y, Z um, he wasn't irrational I think you go by his MO his MO was that he thought he could buy games or he could influence games and I don't think I think if he's doing it for the Valencia end game then he's certainly doing it in the Champions League yeah and He's tried it in the, the dressing room against us. But therefore, that's not the first time that's happened. Or that's not an isolated incident. This is a guy that's, that's uh, control. His ego is basically controlling the, the mind and the body. So, I, I, I look back in this as we were cheated out. No, I'm not going to say we were cheated out of the cup because there's no guarantee that beat Milan, of course. But yeah. over the course of those games... There's no doubt in my mind that um, something went on. Yeah. To proving it's another thing. Um, but you're, well, you're right. We never held up our end of the bargain, but the inches across that campaign can make a difference. Yeah. I guess the point would be the efficacy doesn't actually matter. It's the attempt to bribe and to, to contort um, football matches is in and of itself yeah. enough. Um, it, you know, it, we, I just mentioned those those four things because you know this is the debate that's going on and on and on. Whereas you know we we, we didn't exactly do our, our job there, um, but it's any attempt should really be enough. Um, John, this wasn't even Tappy's first, um, probably in the European Cup. Um, strong claims he tried it with with eight, eight Athens before, uh, and then um, the the European Cup semi final. Um, where he, he did get Marcy did get to the final um, in 91 uh, he paid over 2 million francs for television rights for the game against Spartak Moscow but it was later admitted by those involved to actually to bribe the Spartak players and he was said to have handed a note to a journalist before the game with instructions to open it only after the final whistle and it simply read 3-1 which of course was the nature of the win Marcy probably shouldn't have been playing in 92-93 and um, Again, your thoughts on the, the whole fun and games? Um, I do believe he was at it. Uh, unlike you, Moscow, the 6-0, was a go tack game, is my belief. Uh, you look at all the other results and everything else, you look at defending that night, and it, you, you're looking for a logical reason why he does it. He does it because, he, as Andy says, he, he's flaky. I mean, why would you go into the referees... Uh, dressing room at half time against Rangers when you're one up and we've not really troubled them too much they have been by far the better team if you're really going to have a discreet word surely you would even just get the guy you know either a go between or go to his hotel um, you know you don't need to well, why do it I think he's just flaky I think he, he does it a lot some of which we don't uh know about I have no uh, I have no issues though uh, we'll, we didn't beat Marcy and there's nothing in those two games which you can point to that says that happened and that was wrong that you could maybe impact, argue yeah. go to the penalty um, my biggest fury latterly as I've mentioned is against Haley. I think his if his memory now is correct, he is a disgrace because he should have flagged it up in November. There was no point in us complaining after the match in Marseille because you don't do it afterwards because you just look like a whiner. If we had it in the November, you don't even need to make it formal. You can raise it. You know, Campbell Ogo, if anybody else had this coming through, it seems strange. We're sure there's nothing to it. You know, just let everybody know there's something there. Maybe get to see the things back off. For Hately to not tell anybody, know he's targeted, and then as Goff says, 
in the end of season video, Mark says he pushes the guy to be fair, it was closer to a right hook. I think David said last week his 40 year old self said it's never a, a sending off. Well, the 14 year old self inside me also said that the adult, as indeed every adult in the stadium that night, said, You can't do that in Europe. You have given the referee, whether he's bent or not, you can have no complaints yeah, getting sent yeah, off. Yeah. You have no complaints. So there are. I mean, you can say they did this, whatever we could, but there's nothing you can put. There's nothing you can say. How did it impact on us? I mean, CSK Moscow tried hard against us. Uh, <laughs> the Corinthians, but it's dead. People have getting paid to play football. This, get, all we're arguing about is who has paid them to get the best result. Mm. Oh yeah, again, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I don't. Uh, let, let me be clear. Um, I, I, as I said, it would not surprise me if. All of these instances were correct, and and yep. Tappy had nobbled everybody. My point about the Moscow game is that it didn't matter. Marseille were always winning that game of football. Um, it's their easiest game of the six. Uh, that that that's not a. If they had nobbled them in Moscow, um, then I think that might have been a wee bit more productive and impactful, especially as we drop points in the very same night. Um, I, I I agree. With his, 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 the sending off Saitley's fault. Especially with that knowledge that the, there was some kind of jiggery pokery. Remember, he, he got a call at the blue a couple of times from um, uh, supposedly a French or a French agent had had passed this his number on to someone from France to to miss the two games, um, pull up with an injury or or whatever. He only tells, according to Haley, he only tells Smith and the players in the dressing room at half time when they came in uh, home to Bruges that this happened. Um, <laughs> But no one mentions um, it for for twenty years. I mean, the first I ever heard of that yeah, story. Yeah, I struggle. With, yeah, I struggle with that. That that it came out twenty years later. Uh, and uh, first I heard of it was twenty. Al- yeah. yeah, the twenty eleven STV documentary on this season. I think is the first time because Haley has a book out in ninety four. Not a word. Um, <clears throat> And again, he's accounting his uh, in the, the twenty eleven documentary and accounting his his new book with Alistair Aird, um from last year. Um, it, it's very clear. They said, "Yeah, uh, now," because Smith was furious at the, the the sending off, absolutely apoplectic, at the time. Um, and he, you know, Haley Haley's account is they knew they come in the dressing room and said, "That doesn't surprise me." Here's why. Um, but also, I can understand. Nuisance calls or whatever like that. And say, oh, fuck off. Haley says you. He told him just fuck off. Um, not get involved. Don't want to get involved. How are we going to prove it? What what difference does it make? And again, I come back for all this nonsense and all this. We could be in the ear of a referee. We know that Tappy goes into our or the, the referee's dressing room in our game at half time to offer the referee some help. That in and of itself should have seen Marseille eliminated from the competition. Does it matter if it worked or didn't work? Or whatever. Well, well, it, it's not going to happen because Rangers don't push it, and it's, it, and I kind of furious in, fu- furious in hindsight. Well, this is the other thing, John, and that, that that's fair enough as well. And it's maybe why Rangers don't do a thing. A, they want to join this club, don't rock the boat, because um, the the, the Marseille argument or the, the argument that James Dixon makes in his um, account is that Marseille was just if you can't beat them, join them. Because they were they were diddled out of a, a couple of European trips in the in in, in the eighties, um, so yeah. this is kind of playing the game. But you're absolutely right. Would they have done anything? They know a lot about the the Ike Athens. I think it was from nineteen eighty nine, and UF have done nothing. They haven't stripped them of their their, their, their title. So even if Campbell or, or, or David Murray himself um, had had gone and said, "Look, he was in the referee's room," and the referee and his assistant could verify that. Uh, there's a drug, there's a doping official in there as well. Um, UEFA want their final M- Milan against Marseille. And funnily enough, talking about Milan, a club that when I was around at that time, I, I had a lot of fondness for. Um, the week after the, the Champions League final, they were at home to Brescia. They just needed a point to clinch the title. Very passive game for a game where Milan could win. Uh, Dimitri Albertini scored just eight minutes on the clock. And then an incredible equaliser a minute later. Um, Paolo Maldini and Franco Baresi, two of the greatest defenders in the history, seemed to be just playing in slow motion. Uh, a point for Brescia would keep them up. And in turn, 
relegate one of Milan's great rivals, Fiorentina. Joe Jordan's in co-commentary duty for Channel 4's coverage in Football Italia, and he called it out immediately. He said Milan have let them score there, but he didn't seem bothered. Um, and this new football era that we're getting into, maybe some habits are still finding it difficult to, 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 to you know die easily. Um, um, as James Dixon says brilliantly in his book, a week either side of the Champions League final, both its participants had uh, been involved in fixing matches. One was punished and one was not. Um, anyway, the full scale uh, was never punished, never truly and fully known, but it, it still aggravates a, a generation of Rangers supporters to this day, including Cammy Bell. Um, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, boys, we still had trophies to tidy up, um, but Rangers would have to do it without their golden boy. Uh, Scotland's World Cup qualification went from being merely inauspicious to an outright disaster. Um, in Lisbon, they were hammered 5-0 by the Portuguese, where McCoist suffered a broken leg. He was in target for an incredible 60 goals that season, um, and the form of his life was suddenly over. Um, Andy, can you recall that I was out, I think I was playing football that, that night, it was a Wednesday night, I think, uh, I, I do remember the, the news coming through on the radio that, that he'd broken his leg, um, and in 1993, that's still, we don't quite, Baxter era, uh, Jeopardy with a broken leg, but it's still, it's still a dodgy one, will he come back, will he come back anywhere near this kind of flush form? It was a body blow. No question about it. You know, into each life, a little rain must fall. The, the season was going so well, there was so much at stake. You, you're still dreaming about what it could be. And, um, I, to look, to, I mean, we, I had antagony towards the Scottish national team anyway. And as usual, it was just inflamed again because we lose this goal scoring machine. Yeah, a, a debacle in Portugal. And, uh, you know, it's not like McCoist injuries of past where we think back to his daughter Bucharest and he made a miraculous recovery because it was some muscular or mm. ligaments or that's a broken leg. You don't you don't get him come back for that until you're ready. So he's gone and um, immediately the McCoist Hately partnership that's so fearsome is gone. But you look at the domestic side of things and you, and you still don't think that that's going to derail things. It's not a one-man team as, as much as they two score all the goals. Um, there's, there's just so much in this team. And, and I think we've bought into the will to win, being stronger than anything else and all that really matters. So massive blow, huge disappointment. Big, big problem to McCoy's personally. You know, it's his greatest ever season. It's just... Typical that you that things like this happen. Um, was he ever the same player? Hmm. Arguably not. I mean, it's it's hard. Um, it would have been hard anyway, I think, for him to maintain that kind of level, um, even without an injury. But to come back from a broken leg, he wouldn't score anywhere near those kind of goals again, John. But as we will see as we we continue this series, he still popped up with important goals and uh, that that was kind of his uh, his thing it became his thing as, as time went on rather than than absolute bag fools um the mccoy's hately thing then 140 goals between them in those two seasons alone 91 92 92 93 um most of those goals coming when both of them were on the pitch widely regarded and uh, in terms of a front pairing because of the modern age that they played, you know, front pairings would become less fashionable pretty quickly. Um, as certainly one of our best, if not the best, in my opinion, the best. But they only played really in that kind of consistent pattern for eighteen months. You're only really talking November ninety one to April ninety three. Um, and I, I, I don't think we really think of it like that because so many goals and such a legend that you think maybe you and they must have been together for, for three, four, five years as a, as a partnership but it really was only 18 months. Packed quite a few in. Yeah. It surprised me but it doesn't surprise me because that's what happens doesn't it? When you break down partnerships so even you go back to the 60s how often does that great team play together or whatever you get injuries one, both, whatever they just had a purple patch, and that's why they're remembered. Uh, a very long purple patch, uh, where 
at a time when the team was also successful, which which enormously helps in terms of being remembered. Uh, there's no point in scoring loads and loads of goals if um, the team's not winning anything because you don't be remembered. And they just are. And both fairly mature when they start hitting it off. It's not the two young mm-hmm. guys bursting mm-hmm. through. I mean, they're close. Must, I think Haley's over 30. Is he 32 that year? And yeah, McCoy's just, might yeah. be just turning 30. Um, so, I mean, really, they're hitting that sort of that purple patch when they're 28, 29, 30. And they just, I mean, McCoyst is one of the most intelligent players you'll see in generally in terms of reading, playing, whatever. Uh, probably better in his head maybe than on his feet sometimes. Well, a marvellous player. And, and as you say, it's for 18 months as a strike force. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it goes close, but it's not actually that long. I mean, if you're measuring those kind of time scales, you might say the season of Smith and Smith and Johnson when they're bursting and everything is up there. It just doesn't tend to happen for whatever reasons. And yeah, Ali getting his leg broke was. You know, I never found. Don't think I found out about it until the next morning because uh, I, I, I would have still, but especially then, I didn't want Scott Rangers players picked for playing for that joke of a team. I thought it was bad habits, bad atmosphere, losers. Generally, if, if Andy had disdain, you know, he that was the positive side of things. Yeah, I, I think, I think the bad habits. I think the bad habits were coming for the Rangers players, to be honest, and that that's Scotland camp from 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 all accounts. But um, yeah, it, it was it was a huge blow. Um, Saturday, first of May, ten days after the heartbreak of Siska, it was McCoy's young deputy Gary McSwiggan who would score the only goal against Airdrie Andy to secure the title and the fifth in a row. And the first time that's been done, of course, um, since the Struth era. Um, it was again. It was a, a matter of uh, when, not if. Um, I ran on the park. I'm sorry to, to inform you both. Um, <laughs> uh, I did check with my dad and the policeman, um, who just said, "On oh, you go, son." Um, but it was becoming ceremonious now. Um, you know, when are we going to win the title? Um, but yeah, five in a row is a big a big deal. And now, really, um, the questions are starting to. Well, yeah, be asked about can he, can they do the nine? Aye, uh, you're right in, in terms of saying the ceremonious, but the flip side of being so dominant and so far ahead is that you know it's coming, so there's no joyous occasion where you win it like a cup fan or something like that. And it was just a case of like, let's get it over the line. I think, um, the team were, I wouldn't say they were labouring, but there was no massively free-flowing football or anything like that. It was, it was more pragmatic and workman like than anything else. And Young McSwagan comes in and scores that goal for an acute angle in a pretty, for what I can remember, pretty stuffy game. Nothing really spectacular happening yeah. in it. But, aye, this is, this fifth in a row tips the balance towards the nine. And people start talking about it in serious terms because... You look at the roadmap that lies in front of Scottish football and our main Rangers, and as we've spoken about ad nauseum on this series, the chasm is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and your challengers are getting left in a slipstream. They're getting further and further behind year on year. Celtic are nowhere to be seen. Aberdeen are a fading power. The United have gone by this point. So any sensible person or observer is going to ask, right, what needs to happen to stop Rangers winning this for the foreseeable future? And there's no an answer <laughs> because mm. there, there is nothing except us blowing up or having, I don't know, some kind of cataclysmic injury record for the rest of the season. But even at that, we're just going by any more players. Mm. So it's a juggernaut and nine in a row starts becoming a thing. It's, in, it's, it's It becomes part of the lexicon by this point. Uh, it absolutely what did. stuns me in that one is that Smith actually mentions nine in a row because I watched it and I was stunned in the end of season video. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's he now it's now become it. something I mean, unavoidable. Is, yeah, I mean, it just uh, which gobsmacked me. I mean, even more so than when he was talking about the treble when you still had a semi final to talk about. You know, the circumstance manager yet to really come into play. 
I mean, there is this thing. There's also, I think, around this time, there is, I mean, people might laugh, but there is a bit of optimism that maybe we've gotten a few youngsters coming in. You know, mm-hmm. McSwiggins had, oh, he's, he scored the goal that won the league and he scored the goal against Marseille. Higgins mm-hmm. come in, Murray, Presley. And you think, OK, we'll be buying players, but this is maybe getting back to a more traditional Rangers way of doing things or things. But yeah, nine in a row is there, but I, I always struggled with it. As soon as you start getting defined by the other lot, I always think that's you kind of losing it. So I'd have more respect if people were talking 20 in a row or something rather than matching them. Thing. <laughs> Which it was, to be fair. Uh, to be fair, yeah. and we'll get into it as, as the weeks go on. Um, but it, it it would be a relief to get nine. I mean, I'm not spoiling anything here. I think um, if you see Smith's reaction at Tannadice that night and, and around that season, it's a relief to do that. That was the bare minimum, and I think that's the, that's the issue um, that it's now become the bare minimum. Ten is actually the objective, but yeah, we will get there. Um, it did leave Smith and his side an entire month nearly um, effectively without competitive football before the Scottish Cup final on the 29th of May. Uh, Rangers won two and lost two of the remaining league matches, but the 1-0 defeat up at Pitodri was not a portent of things to come. Good pass from Ferguson, this is Hallstrom. Trying to get away from Stephen Wright. Young fullback did well. So too did Ryan Grant. That's McCall. A chance on here for Murray. The deflection and the opening goal for Rangers. The youngest player on the field opened the scoring in the cup final in the 23rd minute of the match. Neil Murray for Rangers. That's on my hate play. This is Durant, Hayley again, strong play by Wright, Hayley's clear, this is danger for Aberdeen! And a magnificent goal from Mark Hayley, the second for Rangers, the sheer delirium among these Rangers players, his strength and his pace and his accuracy earned that second goal. Okay, the Scottish Cup final, then the treble done at Parkhead, um, a beautifully warm spring afternoon, gents. Uh, Richard Goff said at the end there was no way we were losing today's game. Um, Rangers looked to try and just get it done early. Um, it was just power in that, that first half, almost like a sheer force of will, especially that Hately second. Um, he can hardly stand up um, after uh, or keep his feet after the, the kind of um, uh, subsequent celebration. Um, there's a bit of squeakiness uh, when that, that Lee Richardson goal went in. And as I've said many times, anyone who thinks that the, that Rangers team uh, could have given uh, Milan a, a real go in that final, just look at the exhaustion um, and the, 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 the end of that, that, that particular uh, afternoon. But it was thoroughly deserved. The treble fitted this team. It would have been an absolute travesty if it hadn't um, been done as I think 1988-89 was a travesty because it, it, it wasn't achieved. Um, and yeah, were any of us in the jungle? I was. I got a wee certificate. I was, um, I was in Aberdeen. Uh, no, I was Celtic. Uh, as was, uh, I'd, I'd been in the jungle once before. I think it was the uh, high, the day of Hillsborough, mm. and I never would to go back there. I mean, you couldn't see the game, and it, the safety aspects, oh, it was just horrific. So, no, I, I might even swap the ticket to go uh, a couple of Rangers tickets Ente. to go the other way. Yeah, that uh, well. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the wee yeah, certificates were, 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 were fun. Um, Celtic um, just put on a... Cause, sorry, the, 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 the jungle terracing was being seated that summer um, and Celtic had yeah. to put on a kind of um, event uh, in the midweek following it just so the fans could have a sing-song, just so that the last crowd in there was obviously not the Rangers support. And did you say you were up the Aberdeen end? Or which would normally be called the Rangers I, end? Me, me and my dad were in the Aberdeen fans because we couldn't get tickets. And um, believe it or not, <laughs> Changed days, eh? We were up the back. I've changed days. We were, exactly. We were up the back, and at half time, we went right right outside, and there was actually a number of Rangers fans 
congregate and they just kind of found each other and say, this is hellish and I need to get out of here. So what happened is I got my dad to punch me in the nose because a nosebleed <laughs> and we got taken, <laughs> we got taken down to the first aider next to the jungle and I sat there for 10 minutes waiting for the bleeding to stop and then he says, has it stopped? I says, aye. He says, where did you come from? And we pointed to the jungle and got the Rangers in for the second half. There you go. Great that story. is quite the story. Um, I mean, having done I that trip to... There, Andy, but you could easily just say you the migraine and go to ta- tablet. <laughs> that is what always happened at Hamden uh, with, with fans. You just went down, particularly if you were younger, limp or something. Yeah, uh, I mean, that is no wonder you would decide to become a bus convener after that. Yeah. I, mean. <laughs> I, I, need, I need to qualify. I mean, I didn't, it wasn't like a full blown stuntman punch the face. I, I used to have a punch on for my nose would bleed all the time for the slight sweet thing. Oh, here we so go. kind of gave me a wee tap in the bridge of the nose. It wasn't as a child abuse or anything like that. <laughs> He's wanted to punch me in the face since, but uh, for moving tickets. That's Esther Ranson on there. Um, <laughs> I mean, having been to Pitodri for that, that February game and seen guys dragged out mini buses and whatever to get their, their heads kicked in. I mean I'm sure there were a few willing volunteers um standing around you. It was pretty tense uh in those days still is I guess. Um but yeah, that was it, the treble. Um John, you've seen them. Andy you have or hadn't at that point. I hadn't. They were this kind of mystical thing. Um can you remember that being a, a kind of special day, a a, a milestone for user angel support? Because I, I know I did. It was um, it would have been a major disappointment to to not make it, and I think there was a sense of relief as well because it kind of rubber stamped what we knew about this team, which was there was something special. So um, it's a moment in time. So you know, I wasn't really thinking about the treble per se. I was thinking more about this team. Um, as you say, the the eighty eight eight nine season was, was still fresh in the memory because that was a great team as well, but never got the treble. And it was always kind of viewed as a kind of was a failure, you know. It was t- tainted because of that. So I... Relief, but also a lot of pr- pride in the team. Mm. They, they achieved absolute proof of what they were that year. Yeah, well, that's the thing, isn't it? It underlines uh, what, what yeah. actually happened. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's just highlight the dominance. Yeah. I mean, that's what... I mean, that was the downside to 89. Uh, in a huge way, not just because we lost to them, but because I'd seen it 76, 78, and those were reinforcements of dominance. And this team deserved the treble. This group of players deserved the treble because before it was cheap, cheapened by, you know, the two, two horse race being reduced to one horse race, hmm. it was a big thing. And very few teams did it. And when you did it, you tended to. You know, had to produce that. And this team, as indeed did 80, 80, 89, probably deserved it more than most. But it was, I wouldn't say relief, but I think it's a sense of satisfaction, sense of pride, just a sense of these guys deserved it. You know, I, I personally do think we would have beaten Milan. Uh, you see, we were running in fumes. Have you looked at Milan's last twelve league games? Yeah, they I mean, they, they certainly <laughs> Capello picked a very interesting team in Munich that night. That's for sure. And listen, who who knows? All I'm saying is that they're a bit better than Aberdeen, as as tired as they they, they may have been. Um, but yeah, the the, the chance, especially with Hately back to, but no McCoys and blah 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 yeah. blah blah. Anyway, so well, I'm, would McCoys have played in Portugal? Yes, you'd argue. But Milan win one game in the last twelve league games. Nine draws, two defeats, one win. They aren't in good nick. Van Basten, as you say, goes out. I think if we get past Marseille and go to the final, the adrenaline would have taken his aura over. And I'm not sure McCoy would have broke his leg. I know he did because we're in an alternative universe. But in this alternative universe where we're in Munich, I think the dream continues. I think it's only when the dream is over that uh, the wheels start coming off and mm. continue to come off for yeah. quite a while. Well, you know, <laughs> a bird flapping its wings and all that. Uh, Richard Goff said after the this treble was, was for the fans, but 
Um, it belonged to Smith as well. Uh, arriving on the scene as an assistant, he was thrown into the big job in difficult circumstances and stood there wearing the now famous navy blue cardigan as a winner of six out of the seven domestic trophies available to him and had taken his side as far as he'd ever been in Europe's big competition. Uh, speculation mounted around the future of his predecessor. After a torrid season at Anfield, it was Smith who was guiding Rangers to new heights and making the job look very easy indeed. Just far, how far could he go? Well, that clear blue sky seemed to be the limit at that time. Guys, this is the great season of this era. It is the greatest season, I think, in the history of the club. Um, I think Sunis has a better team, 88 to 90, but n- couldn't dream of generating um, the kind of spirit and togetherness that Smith did. I think Smith has a better team in terms of balance, in terms of skill, in 95-96. But his methods of generating that spirit have now, let's say, led to too much in discipline um, to, to really, really kind of shine and make the mark. Was this just a kind of perfect storm, just a sweet spot, Andy, in terms of ability and, you know, the, the, the nature of, of togetherness? I think it was. It's very, very hard to create a dressing room and a culture that binds a team or a squad together so well. It's the lightning in the bottle thing. It doesn't happen by accident. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that you need things to fall into place that sometimes aren't in your control. You need characters in the dressing room and around the club that are like-minded and complementary. And that's a very, very hard chemistry to, to get in any walk of life, for less a football club where you've got such an intense pressure upon you to to, to win and to, and to perform. So uh, it was a a unique squad here. And you, you look at the season before and would you have predicted that we would have got to this kind of place? Mm. I think so. I think the European heights we reached this season were above and beyond many expectations despite the fact, you know, the Champions League is an unknown quantity. Um, but uh, I, th- I think it stands out. It's certainly my favourite season as a Rangers supporter was, A, because I was at that age where you're young and impressionable and, and you're, a, you're a sponge. It was just a great, great time to be a Rangers fan and often turn into old father time and refer to, to, to younger supporters and my nephew and stuff like that and try, try and tell them you know, we were one game away for the Champions League final. Mm. When you say that, you're, it's like a different, it's like a, a parallel universe we're talking about now. John, where do they sit? I think because of a slightly different age, it's it's the best season of my adult life. You, there is something about the mid-70s team um, and the way they played, which would put them close. Uh, but as a season, get that. I always believe we could have won the European Cup in seventy eight, seventy nine, and done back to backs there. It's it's just phenomenal. I think you underrate the team, and I think it's the same as that seventies team. Not you. I think it's underrated because of this character and team spirit. I don't believe there was that much. I think technically the French were better than us, but as a team and as players. I don't think there was as much a chasm as what people highlight because we had we had fantastic players in their prime in McCoy's Taylor, Gorham, Goff, Durant coming back to you just watch that Champions League the whole European Cup run that year. Uh, Ian Ferguson has described McCall's having a great he, they were playing well and probably towards the upper end of their ability. But they weren't playing in a, a zone that, which was completely beyond them. Mm. Things came into thing, but it was it wasn't like going to Manchester, where in Europe you were pinching yourself and you knew you were rolling the dice and getting away with it every time. You know we were in gambler territory. We were holding our own against the best in Europe, uh, and you couldn't actually see. Uh, okay, they say the Nisbet goal or whatever, but I'd count of that with some other things, injuries, whatever. We were playing some decent stuff at decent times all the way through that. And 
Marseille for all they were phenomenal and everything else. I mean, Tappy so enough that he was in a panic that mm. apparently that we we were d- d- going at it. We just were a team. I remember was it world football or whatever in the yeah, match. Yeah, I mentioned it last and night. Not it. Cover. Was, yeah. Yeah. And it, the, no, no, but the front cover, I don't know if it was World Football or whatever, the magazine, it was one of the, and it, the European Cup, me and Duran, and it mm. says, can Rangers do it? Mm. I mean, you would never, you would never get that at any other point, I don't think, maybe apart from the odd one in the 60s or the 70s. It just was a point where we were respected. It's where I wanted to be, it's where I always wanted to be, where you just were never talked about it wasn't oh look at those plucky Scots it literally was watch out for this team from Glasgow they've got something about them it wasn't oh they're a bit lucky people were genuinely thinking we don't want them and that really happens to us I mean and we're talking the top teams I mean I I repeat it because it's remarkable the world soccer awards in 1992 in December uh, Rangers were voted the fifth best football team in the world that just feels so bizarre now but um, yeah I think quite a lot of us would have nodded their head and say yeah that that's where we we Top should 10, be yeah, that, that, yeah, that, yeah that's certainly where we, we aim to be uh, and this is going to be a thing forever mm-hmm. um, thank you John well thanks very much thank you Andrew thank you man Tyson over there. Um, winning all four in 92-93 was an unlikely dream rather than an impossible one. Given the margins involved, one more goal in Belgium or in France could have seen Rangers in the final. And as John said, we shall never know the levels that they could have summoned for one final push uh, against the Milan side who were strangely put together on the night. It really did feel possible for the thousands who were on that journey. An exciting dream, but still a tangible destiny. It was only made possible by that team bond, without which those comebacks would not have been possible, nor would the willingness to suffer the mental and physical pain for one another. The team that drinks together wins together, the captain would famously say, team spirit in both senses of the word. Instead, the impossible dream was the hope and expectation that such a season had created for the future, unlike Smith's other modern-day equivalent in 08, we reached the semi order of the UEFA Cup final in Manchester. This did not feel like a one off to many. The Rangers support knew that Smith's second bite at it was one of those runs, never to be repeated. It had to happen that night. In 1993, it felt like this is where the club was supposed to be, where it had been promised by Soonis and then by Murray. It was part of the plan. The problem with this approach that created this romantic adventure was that it could only ever be short term. The heroes were broken, literally McCoy's case, and many would have to be repaired or rested in the coming season. More long term, the team bonding approach to success was never going to last the race against an increasingly professional sport. Again, the necessary Scottish identity of the Rangers side would become more at odds with the continental standard. No one was listening to that in the summer of 93, however. After what that season brought, it was understandably felt that the good old-fashioned British pluck could compete with the very best. After all, the cup winners couldn't beat Rangers. The side had nudged the door to the promised land ajar. The season was very close. Next time, it would be closer. No one could have anticipated that very soon, that same door was about to be slammed shut. Until next time, bye for now.